Okay, I think we'll kick off because we've got a lot to get through. Thank you very much for uh, all coming. Uh, it's a great turnout for this, this amazing session. I'm not going to introduce the panel because you've all got smartphones and you can look up and see who they are. I'd rather hear from them about the things they've got to say about cinematography than waste five minutes telling you who they are when you can see in the program. Um, we've got three cinematographers, two directors and an editor who are all gonna give us slightly different perspectives on the art of cinematography in documentary making. And uh, without further ado, we're gonna get onto a, a good clip. Uh, this is a clip from, uh, that was shot by Stephen Robinson. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just show you the clip and then, then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Stephen, that was uh, from Jane Trey's series, model, This Model Life, back in 2003. Now, in those days, I think even then, most documentaries were being shot on DV or on Digibeta. That was shot on film. Why was that decision made? Well, that was the way that Jane liked to work. And that was the last film that uh, we shot on film, last documentary shot on film. Uh, but you're right, everything else at that time was shot on, on DV or DSL or something, yeah, yeah. But that's just the way that Jane worked. Uh, and how, looking back to those days, of <laughs> mm. those ancient days of shooting a whole documentary on film with presumably 16 mil reels that last, only last 10 minutes. 10 minutes, yeah. The comparison to today where you can shoot with a, you know, a terabyte card that lasts hours and hours. Yeah. Well, lots of things obviously have changed. You know, the cameras have changed you know, unrecognisably now. Uh, but what you're doing with the camera is still the same. You're still chasing that frame. So that, that is the same, same thing. Uh, but you're limited to, to a 10 minute uh, take, which in fact was you know, not, not a bad thing. Although, of course, now I, you know, I, um, I shoot um, you know, for 90 minutes at a time sometimes, almost you know, without cutting. It's an extraordinary difference. But fundamentally, what you're doing with the camera is the same, same thing, exactly the same thing. So do you think that the, 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 the ability to shoot 90 minutes without cutting, is that an, an advantage? Well, I, think or? The, I think the expectation has changed from the audience and the commissioners and everybody else, the director too. You expect to shoot you know, all the time, really, not put the camera down. Um, you know, and I'm, I've embraced that too. I, I, I enjoy that. I wouldn't want to go back to ten-minute roles, no, no, because because you just you struggle all the time. But it had it, there was a discipline of filming that way, which was was a real craft. And I do miss that slightly. I miss the cameras too, because those cameras you were using uh, the Arri SR2 and the Arton XDR. Those cameras were designed to do that job. And what's happened now with cameras is that you have a camera that can do all sorts of different jobs. You, know, you can strip it right down to the, the bare essentials, or you can pimp it right up to a great big you know, camera to shoot a drama on. I'm not entirely sure that's a good thing, <laughs> compared to the, the lovely ergonomic delight of the Arri or the, or the Arton. But uh, that's a, you know, it's a personal thing. If you didn't, if you didn't know that, you, you, you know, as most people don't, then, then you wouldn't, wouldn't matter to you. Can I think? Yeah. Because I think the key word that Steve said there is discipline. And I started in film. And obviously the, the shift from film to video meant that, you know, you weren't as hamstrung by those constraints. But it seems to me, and I th it seems to me that's why we're here today in a way, is that the discipline of shooting with a crew is at risk of being lost. And that obviously film to video was, was a big shift and freed us up in lots of ways. Um, but I think the shift from crew to self-shooting means that there is a risk that a discipline that we have all learned, um, which is, although Steve says he might shoot for 90 minutes at a stretch, the fact is, when I'm working with a crew, you know, we have a fixed time, we stop, we have a proper lunch, we film in the afternoon, we stop again at a reasonable hour, and all our shoots are very planned, and we have a fixed number of days, and we, ha and it is a it's, it's established at the outset, you'll have that many number of days, at the end of those days, you will have shot your film. And I think that, in a way, that's sort of what I think is important to discuss, that that discipline has been lost, and a whole number of things flow from that. About That has a huge impact on this industry, um, and it has a huge impact on directors who are coming up and who have never worked like that. And so films are becoming something else, where... If you're a self-shooting AP and you shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, you will end up with a thousand hours of rushes. 
and that and you don't have to think so hard about your storylines. You don't have to think about that discipline in the same way. It has an impact on the editing, where then there are these vast amounts of rushes arrive in the edit. So I think that in the name of um, you know, strategic decisions that have been made about cost, where everyone says, oh, it's, it's just cheaper to ditch the crews. And I, whereas I understand that those decisions have been taken, They've got, they've got huge implications for quality. They've got huge implications for people learning the discipline and craft of filmmaking. And in a sense, I suppose, that's why, that's why I'm here today, because I think that those decisions have been taken in an, in an unthinking way and without thinking through what the consequences of that, just, oh, it's cheaper. Because um, I think we've ended up with films that, look, that are just... They're not... Um, they're not about. They're not about craft. Then they don't have the same level of intention. Um, Artless. Yeah. <laughs> so Joanna, Joanna, as, a, as an editor, how do you? You've obviously seen that that shift between those. You know, presumably you used to cut films where you'd have very very a shooting ratio of you know three or four to one. And now, I, I'm guessing you sometimes have significantly higher shooting ratios. How do you manage that as an editor? Uh, well, obviously, if you've got our, you know, you've got hundreds and hundreds of hours to trawl through. It's going to take a lot longer in the edit. So there, that there's that, a simple equation there. Um, and also, I think what Vanessa says is very true in the edit that if if you're if you've got something where you've got a, it's been shot very beautifully, then it's you know it's going to be much more focused right from the outset. So it's already a lot of thinking, as Vanessa says, has already been done. If it's, if it's beautifully shot, if it's been thought about, if it's, you know, the director's had to think about it in advance, they've had to communicate that to the cameraman. It's, all, it's a lot further down the road uh, for me, I think. that's. So, Neil, from, from a DOP's point of view, what's, apart from that difference between having 10 minutes and then you've got to change the mag versus being able to shoot for 90 minutes or whatever. What are the differences for you either between the, the film camera days and, and you know, today with something like an Amira or you know, the, the new breed of cameras? I mean, back to the whole kind of thing of you know, 10 minutes or 90 minutes. I mean, I don't know about Steve, but I was probably a shocking DOP half the time. I had, I had many sort of like expressions of disbelief as a director would look at me and going, if you run out, if you haven't run out, you know, as you hear the tick, 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 tick as the film goes at the end of the can as the killer line comes in. But, and, and when that did happen to me on, you know, too many occasions, um, we always knew that the sound recordist would have that bit of sound yeah. And then we think carefully about it and we think about how are we going to get how, you know, if that one line was really, really important, we think carefully about how maybe we might ask it again somewhere else or we, or, or we might think it's OK, we've got the sound, get the reactions of something else going on. And so there was, there was always a, re a way around it, in fact. And actually, I, I mean, I, I actually really enjoyed the move, actually, to videotape in some ways because um, I felt slightly freer in that era. But then I also kind of felt, particularly then, because it was quite a new thing you could go on for longer, that there, 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 there was sort of less discipline and you might have the camera on your shoulder for 35 minutes and you knew the film in its entirety would only be 40 minutes long and, and we had another 15 days filming and we're going, what's going on? This would have been, uh, that, that was sort of significant. Um, so I think, yeah, I th and I think, I think what it, certainly, uh, you know, you, uh, you, I, your mind was more focused um, in those days and every shot felt like it needed to count. It was sort of really, really important. And now you kind of, you've got quite a large sort of buffer area, I would say, mostly on what you work on. And, you know, but there, there is the danger. I mean, I think the danger, I mean, I think, I think Vanessa's right. Maybe part of these sort of conversations today is that, you know, I certainly now get... Um, you know, I was passionately, passionately wanted to work in documentaries as a DOP all the time on observational films. And I was incredibly fortunate that uh, I did. I did have that experience, as, as Steve did. But now, um, I would rarely, very rarely get a phone call 
to, to work on an observational documentary series. You know, very rarely, because it's deemed, you know, there's not the budget to have a crew or a cameraman, you know. Um, fortunately, golden projects like Anthony's come along once in a while, and they say, we've got to shoot this properly, and it is observational, and, and you're back in the zone. But I, can, I think, I mean, I think there... I'm in danger of rambling on, but I think that's kind of, that's key now, that the, the art of having great DOPs to shoot observational films is really sort of slightly dwindling, you know. But then, the, but then equally, there are fantastically talented self-shooting directors. And, you know, quite rightly, they went, you know, one of them won the BAFTA this year for photography. So, you know, it's a real, it's a jumble. You cued me, per OK. We're about to show to, yeah, I'm a girl, actually. Is it? <laughs> oh, OK. Do you want to do that? Or? We'll do that first and then bear, right. bear, keep that no thought problem. in mind. But we'll, this, you've seamlessly connected me to the next clip, which is a demonstration really of, of what personally I think is the hardest thing for any, photog any cinematographer or DOP to do, which is shoot unfolding, reality, unfolding actuality, where you don't know what's happening. Uh, and particularly, you don't know what's happening if it's all happening in a foreign language. So this is a film... Uh, following girls, in this case a girl in, in Cambodia, who is prostituting herself to, to care for her family. Now, presumably they're speaking Khmer. Do you speak Khmer? No. <laughs> so you've got no idea what they're saying. Absolutely. Part, that's a, an intercut of, 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 of set-up interview, but also actuality. Obviously, the argument at the end, you can't intervene. Yeah. How, do you t how do you decide, as a cinematographer, what you're going to follow, where you're going to point the camera, effectively, when you've actually, you can't even understand the language? I think um, when, you, when you, I've done observational shooting for about 10 years, so I think you become really, really good at body language and um, reading people, and I always absolutely wear headphones, so a big thing for me is that you have to listen because you, you know, if you're not listening, how do you know what to shoot and how do you know the story? And so um, shooting... Obviously, we worked. I worked very closely with the director. The director's doing sound on this, so there's just two of us. Um, but we knew the story. We knew that it was her story. It's not his story. Um, it's also obviously my job to get all the the sequence for the editor. Um, but I know that this is her story, and I know. Yeah, I don't know what she's going to say, and I don't really know what the argument's about. It was it was kind of an interesting. We were following her. She was coming home from a a night working at the local park, she's about 16, and um, she came and then this fight just sort of un unfolded in front of us and we had no idea what was going on really, um, but there was a translator there, so the director worked quite closely with the translator trying to figure out, you know, what is actually happening and, you know, it could have just been an argument about the washing up or something, but it was, he was, uh, we found out sort of into the fight that he was um, threatening to stab her with a knife and things, so it was... You know, with two of us there, we were working in this quite intimate space. But I think it's the key to it is listening, so that I know when to go in, when to come out. You know, and and I think you tend to learn a lot about conversations too, and that people talk in circles. So once you get to that circle point, you can then come out and do the non-sync or the wide shots. But if you don't listen, you you yeah, you have no idea. You just sort of then you can and I, I do a little bit of teaching so I can see it with students sometimes. They get very caught up on a particular pretty shot, but they're not yeah, it's kind of being in the space physically. I think another mistake that less experienced cinematographers often make is, is following the action. So you know, and then you end up hose piping between the two. Yeah. 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 So Stephen, you were nodding a lot while Nick was saying that. Well I completely understand what Nick was saying, yes. It's if you're filming observationally. Um, you know, you, 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 and you spend time filming people, you quite quickly work out their, their body language and you can anticipate what they might do next and how they might relate within a, uh, the dynamics of a conversation or an argument. Um, that comes quite quickly, I think, just through experience of, of, of filming people because uh, mm. everyone's different. And when you go, for example, if you go into a room with, uh, full of people, um, you don't quite know where you're going to be but you can quite quickly work out the, 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 dynam the dynamics of that, of that <coughs> conversation or argument and then know where to, where to be with the camera and what might happen next and who might speak next. But, but it would be absolutely right. You know, I see it all the time on TV, following the sync, two cameras possibly filming, which you know, I, I personally think is not always a good idea, but one camera 
getting the response is often far more important than getting the, the actual mouth opening and closing. I, I, I quite, one quick thing, but that's just on, on a similar sort of thing. I mean, I, was, I, mean I, I spent three months in El Salvador filming with a street gang. My Spanish, now I can barely order a beer or, or anything in Spanish, but the director could speak Spanish. We got to know the characters really intimately and the narrative really, really well. And as you say, as a, as a, as a DOP, part of your job is to understand what is going out and, and, and think about what's going to happen next. And, and most of the directing, in fact, on a job like that goes on in either you know, the pub the night before, the, the hotel room the night before, or in the van on the way to the shoot. Because suddenly when you're in it, you've, that effectively you're briefed and then you, you just, you're, in, you're in an observation mode, but you've got an agenda and you're ready to kind of follow any change in development. And I kind of... And I think, you know, if, if, um, I think that's part of the thing as well, I think, for self-shooting now, is you perhaps miss out on that collaboration process and not necessarily having to worry about filming absolutely everything and actually just making sure you get the sync and get the line. Because actually, a lot of my anxiety when I'm shooting is that I'm going to get in trouble because I didn't actually build the scene as well, you know, as well as try and capture it. And I think, so I think that kind of discipline is quite interesting, I think, from our point of view. You know, Chris, that Christy, of... when you are filming that way, you will miss something. You will miss it. It will happen. But the, the, the skill really is knowing how to get over that and what the shots you need to get around that. And I think that's what's disappeared now. You, everyone films everything all the time. You end up with a thousand hours of material that someone's got to cut. But actually, you know, you, there are other ways of doing it. You can, you can, you can get around all sorts of things. We're going we're gonna to come to the tower in a sec, which, mm. and I, I want to get the, a director's point of view mm. on, on actuality there. But, but first of all, I just, before we move on from this clip, I just want to ask you, you shot that on a 7D, and yeah. that was before Magic Lantern was available on the 7D. So you were essentially shooting on a stills camera that was designed to be a stills camera that could just about do video as well. Yeah. And, and <laughs> that you had to be behind the only place, no viewfinder. I mean, how did you find working in those early days of the DSLRs? It, it's difficult because, as Steve was saying before, it's you Frankenstein a camera um, to do something that is not really a good thing to do. But we... Um, the director wanted to... We, we, she had a very low budget and we travelled to uh, seven countries around the world with just our carry-on um, and our che one check-in. So, um, And she, we wanted to be very low-key. We were in places like Afghanistan and um, Cam Cameroon and all sorts of places. So um, we sort of had to fly under the radar a bit. So it was... Um, was more to do with the mechanics of that, the choice of... But, yeah, I sort of spent a lot of time in pre-production making sure that, um, you know, it could sit on my shoulder properly with the right rig and the right um, clip-on sort of viewfinder thing so that I could shoot this. A lot of the rest of the film is actually done on, um, on tripod, but in very sort of more considered frames because we had a lot of discussion about if we are going to shoot DSLR, then you know, that's going to dictate slightly that, you know, we just let things happen within the frame that way. But, um, yeah, it's not uh, not the ideal, you know, Frankenstein setup. But I just wanted to add before as well that um, I, because I've been shooting 10 years, so I came in with the PD-150, but I was taught a lot of that rigour of shooting and the discipline of shooting and the shooting with intent, which was always so important. And I think, just to add to what you were saying before, was... A lot of the time, it's so good. You have to sit there and be with the, the people that you're, that you're with and just sit on the mat in the hut, wherever you are, because that time spent doing that, not shooting, and getting to know them and really like building that relationship, if you like, is, so, is, is as important as shooting everything, you know, whatever happens. Normal. It used to be sort of, I think even on the model film, 2002, I had a day with Erin and uh, uh, Ruth and, uh, before we, with no filming at all, just meeting them. That's inconceivable now. <laughs> inconceivable. But, uh, because that relationship is vital. They have to, you know, they have to trust you, really, because you know, you've got to spend a year together. Which perfectly cues up the next clip, which is from Anthony's uh, BAFTA-winning series, The Tower, um, from a few years ago. Which, again, I mean, how long were you shooting that for? Three years. Three years. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's see a clip from that. 
Hmm. So, Anthony, my understanding is that, hmm. the, that you didn't know the ex-girlfriend was going to walk in at that point. So no. how, how Neil talked about, you know, the briefing hmm. on the way there and the night before. How do you prepare a DOP and what do you well, then hope Well, I mean, for? you know, we were lucky enough to, you know, have a long period to kind of research. You know, I, had, I spent a month, uh, oh, I think it was about a month and a half on the tower by myself. And actually, going back to this kind of idea about... Uh, whether crews can do this. You know, even at that time, crews weren't still the done thing. And it was actually really about going to the BBC and saying, listen, instead of me having four APs, I want to get rid of all of that and actually have a buyout with a DOP and, you know, and a, and a young sound man, and we'll spend the three years doing it that way and a, a really small unit. And by that, with that kind of discipline, you start from the ground up with your crew, and it's all about continuity. It's all about continuous storyline, all about them knowing your characters, all about understanding the kind of the precinct that you're working in, it's different rhythms, you know, all the kind of storylines that you're looking for. So this was quite early on in, when we were filming The Tower, and, and Lawrence had told me about Donna, and I had, he didn't really want to kind of deliver too much information apart from the fact and also Nikki told me that the other guy in there that, that Lawrence was obviously very upset and they'd just broken up and she'd come in and what happened was is that suddenly Paul had to react and I was hiding behind him and we didn't move we kept it very slight and Nikki and uh, um, Lol had radio mics on and we just let the scene unravel and I think the key thing about it was is that that scene actually changed the whole thing for me because it was like a stepping stone. You realise this is actually about a guy who's not so much a junkie. That's a kind of the obvious way to deal with it and whether he's going to come off or not. This is actually a guy who's had a broken heart and that, you know, she had left him and, you know, then you realise that um, uh, she wasn't going to come back. He descended back into heroin and his friend Nicky was trying to uh, keep him off it. So you actually ended up having three different storylines, all from that one scene. And the key is really is because I didn't really start doing interviews with them at the beginning, you get to realise that they, that's what they imagine filming is. You're just there and you observe. If you're constantly at the beginning, tell me where we are, what are you doing, how are you feeling, you know, your characters in, automatically think, oh, well, that's what the process is. So they wait for you, you know, and if you, you, could, you don't have any space to be observational because they're going to think, and they're also then thinking, what's he going to ask? You know, what's going to happen next? And so it takes a kind of immediacy out of things. And I also think that if you don't, if you start with that at the very beginning, then, you know, you will then, that you will just, it's almost an implicit grammar that you establish with your character. And that, I think, gives you the space to be observational. Um, and, yeah, and by that, then I kind of leave interviews to, you know, I leave them for a while until I know primed already. And in, and in terms of working with your cameraman in a situation like mm. that, how much are you directing and how much... I mean, obviously you can't really talk when it's quite an intense yeah, yeah, exchange, yeah. so how much are you directing and how much are you distrusting I, your DOP? I stay very close to them as much as possible, but I've got this big thing about eyeline, so I will really hide behind the DOP. I, will, and I, would, I'd never, I, I might whisper in their ear saying, listen, I think we might be moving soon, or you know, there, there might be something going on. Or i say, listen, once you've got what you've got, there might be something to the side. I would never say, turn around now, this is amazing. Or the worst, I think, is you put your sort of hands around their waist and just physically <laughs> move them like that. Which is a friend of mine told me the other day, and it was like, don't, don't do that. So, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a kind of... And a, a lot of it's about that continuity and wanting to work with a group of people who've got the, like, you know, like-minded sort of vision for something. And in that situation where, you, where they leave the room, mm. have you got a sound man? Yeah, yeah. So he's, he can hear what's going on. Yeah. Can, can you or the cameraman hear what's going on? Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got an earpiece, cameraman's got an earpiece. And that's another thing, and I, I noticed that you did that as well, is you just don't lose the frame. You don't know what's going to happen. And one of the nicest shots you can get in observation is when they come back into the room. They go out, they come back in, and you're, you're there. You know. Hold the shot. I mean, I, I'm a massive fan of Paul Otter, who, who yeah. shot that film. He's Absolutely. just brilliant, brilliant DOP. But what, what, was, what was sort of really wonderful about watching some of the shots in that scene is you see the scene sort of um, develop. So he might be on somebody sort of chatting away. The reaction of the guy listening was actually more interesting. Mm. You're at, you're at the flat, that room would have been no smaller than this little room of circle. So as they start trotting down the corridor 
and then suddenly um, there's an intervention in that scene going on. It was more interesting to stay on the reaction of the mate outside the room. You knew they had the audio going on. And I think actually, you know, I think that's, that's quite magical when, when you're, you're not just cut, cut on sync. There's sort yeah. of some really devel de development of a scene, you know, just like watching a, the scene in a movie, actually. Yeah. It, there's a kind of sort of, I wouldn't say it's an ego thing, but there is a thing where you have to kind of, you're not the, you're there to observe. You're not there to kind of like impose your character on you know your contributors and then constantly follow them. Just wait. Just wait and be patient, and you'll find that things will come to you. You know. And there are some DOPs that I work with who trained on film who got a bad reputation for it because they will just hold a frame, and they will hold it and hold it. And I've often gone to the DOPs and said. I said, well, what's happening? He goes, just watch, just watch. And then suddenly something just comes into frame. And it's that ability to be able to see what's going, what's going to happen next. And it is what you're talking about, being able to pre, you know, preempt human behaviour and physical movement and how people gesticulate and, 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 and what they're going to do. But that, that's quite a bold skill. And I think it's something that, uh, to be fair to self-shooting directors or DOPs, it's very hard because you... You've got a multitude of things to think about, where you're going to go, what you're going to ask, what's happening next, you know, plus the technical elements to it. It's a, it's a massive kind of sort of, you know, melange of things you have to kind of worry about. And, um, and I think you kind of, it's just, it, it gives you the sense to be patient and let things kind of unravel in front of you. Oh, yeah, something that I notice yeah. now is that um, it's, it's, it's disappearing, is when you are filming mm. in the moment, uh, um, ob observationally, um, you know, with a camera, often, as I shoot, on a long lens, mm. you are right in on something that the people around you can't quite see the way you see yeah. it. And also in your head, you're, you, you're picking out the shots, you're cutting the film as you go along in your head, mm. knowing what shots you need, and where people are in the room, and what you might need to get next. Um, but crucially, you've got to see it through to the end. Yeah, yeah. Because totally. what you've done the last 10 minutes only makes sense if you get that shot, yeah. which is coming up in a moment. Because no one else might know that. And lots of people do. I think if that also, if, you, if you're not experienced like that, you get this, because there are lulls in scenes. You know, there's only certain points where you think, oh my God, this is great, it's fantastic material. Then there's a lull and you think, oh, I'll just turn off. Or I'll start, when it, you see when they get bored, they start trumpeting. You know, they go in and out, you know, and you're thinking, okay, you're slightly, you know. Or you think, oh, forget it, the scene's finished. And then the scene carries on. So that's that a bit. It's just to sort of sit and be patient and to yeah, wait. Once, once they think you've finished filming, often is you, you get the best. You get the best, best stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, okay. Yes. We'll get, oh, sorry. sorry. Can yeah. I add something that, mm. that's in that clip, and I think in Vanessa's work as well, is that, and then everybody's the, all the clips we've seen is that um, the the art of the cinematographer is so amazingly skilled, and it's it, it's it's so highly developed that you start you almost can't see it because it's so good it looks completely it looks like that you're just filming in that room mm. it looks like someone so yeah exactly. that, that's what i mean right. it, 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 it it's, it's yeah. so good mm. that it looks natural mm. and it's incredibly hard that's what i would also try to achieve with the editing that you try so incredibly hard in the edit to make it look as though it should have always been that way. It couldn't have been another way. That, you know, that, so you can't but see it. But drama is cut like that. Drama is about exactly. performance drama and it's about choices of takes, you know, yeah. and really well shot, observational, that gives you all those, it gives you options. It gives you yeah. options to build the scene yeah. in different ways. Um, and I think part of the problem as well is that if, if it's badly yeah. shot, it's just you're going to take ages to cut something to just make sense of it. Yeah. And then you have to might impose something else that well, might feel upon, artificial. Upon, upon and style now, of, you know, well, exactly. now depth of field start and all that nonsense. Looking at the yeah. style. Well, actually, good photography, you shouldn't really notice at all. No. Yeah, it should tell the because, story. Because it should enhance the story, and the story mm. is what's important. Mm. So the photography should not really ever be top of the list. Mm. And when it is, I'm more slightly suspicious. Yeah. Because <laughs> some of the ingredient isn't, 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 exactly. isn't working. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to uh, one of Vanessa's clips now, Walking with Dogs. Uh, let's just watch it first, and then, and again, we'll watch it, then talk about it. So, Vanessa, in that clip, um, there's, I understand that it was actually quite a tense situation mm. in that hostel, but it doesn't feel it. You know, it feels very relaxed no, I mean, and lovely. I think that was shot in a homeless hostel, and um, I suppose it does follow on from... It's very interesting hearing all the cinematographers talk, because I think the thing for me that is really crucial is that um, in an observational situation like that, my job, there are, there are two very distinct jobs. 
my job is I'm, I'm in a homeless hospital. There's a lot of people completely off their faces roaming around. Um, the guy, the guitarist, has said, has had a tantrum, a very strange guy, saying he doesn't want, he's changed his mind, he doesn't want to sing a song with Jilly, who was our character. He's stomped off in a huge stop, we can't get him back. A lot of other very drunk, slightly frightening people in the homeless hostel are saying they don't want the dog in the communal area where we know we want to film because the little bedrooms are too small to film in. So we're trying to get Alfie back to sing the song. We're trying to get the drunken people to stop objecting to the presence of the dog in the communal area. Um, we're trying, I'm trying to negotiate what song are they going to sing because I don't know what songs they do sing. We've got very... Um, and then we finally get Alfie back and he's saying he'll only do one song. You know, it's a total, totally fortuitous that the song they sing relates to the subject matter of the film. Um, so while I'm dealing with all of that, which is a very, very volatile situation and anything could have kicked off at any time, um, there was some bloke trying to, who decided he needed to heat up 12 hot cross buns, you know, at the vital moment, who happened to live there too. Um, so all of that is kicking off. And then Johan Perry, who shot that, you know, who manages to always be very still and incredibly calm in any situation, he is just he, shooting and shooting that scene very beautifully. Um, and so there are, two, there are two completely distinct jobs, and there was just no way that one person could be doing both those jobs. Um, and he only had one go at filming that song. So, you know, you look, there's all those cutaways, but he, he covered, you know, we got the dog, we got up the, he got the legs of the dog, you know, he got the dog looking sad, he got Jilly, you know, he got that amazing pan from Jilly across the, you know, slightly that reveal where it's suddenly Alfie and he's like, oh my God, the guy, you know, has got a whole look going on. Um, <laughs> and... All those kinds of shots, um, you, you know, as cinematographers know, to pan across and the whole thing's in focus and the exposure's right, you know, those are really hard shots to do and to do it at the right time. Um, and then obviously we cut away in that scene to a lot of shots that are just very lovely cinematography of all the dogs on Hampstead Heath. Um, but again, there's a lot going on. There's, you know, we're shooting in the rain, we're shooting on a slider. There's a lot of high... Um, highly achieved cinematography and all of that as well. So I suppose that clip for me was, I think that's a really important point that, and it's everything that everyone else has been talking about, that the cinematographer is thinking about who to be on and whether to be on the reaction shot, whereas I am thinking about um, managing my contributors and whether this is even a situation that we can sustain. Um, and that's a very separate job. And it's not, it's not in that clip particularly, but I know that often when I've been shooting with Johan, and I'll be doing an interview, um, I'm thinking about the content of the interview, and I'm thinking really hard about that, or what my next question is, or where the whole thing is going, and it is not, would not be possible if I was also shooting for me to be thinking, now's the time to be on a reaction shot, now's the time to be on the shot of the whoever's in the background or whatever, that Though that, so you get a completely different level of meaning and metaphor and poetry from the cinematography when you've got a DOP there who can be thinking about that while I'm thinking about a whole bunch of other stuff. And I think that, um, without wanting to go on too long, but what's really interesting, even with the really fantastic um, self-shooters who've come out of film school and can really shoot, you know, I think there are... there's. There's people who can't shoot who are shooting, but there are, there's probably 10 people that I can think of in this who can really, really shoot. Um, but what's interesting is that with the development of that way of working, they are now then given a producer to work with them. Um, so that, because actually there still is a recognition that it's a job for two people. So they're given a producer who then manages those situations while they are shooting. So that it's... There's, there's still a recognition, if you like, that it isn't, there's no getting away from the fact that it's a job for two people, but those tasks have sort of been reassigned. And I do think that there is a big question um, which is not asked often enough but when programmes are commissioned, which is if you take into account the 
massively sometimes extended edits that result from self-shooting because you've got literally thousands of hours of rushes. And if you then take into account the cost of a producer for six months or a year, in addition, you know, I produce and direct. You've got a full-time producer and a full-time director um, and a massively extended edit. This assumption that, it, that self-shooting is cheaper um, I think is often erroneous. I mean, I would have thought a producer for six months is, is, is more expensive than the crew that I'm using. Can I just say that scene you described at the hostel there mm. sounds absolutely ideal. <laughs> it sounded fantastic. I, I couldn't wait to get in there and start filming because I always think documentary gets interesting when things go wrong. Mm. Yeah. That's when it gets really interesting. And it's knowing how to make all that work. Isn't that so exciting? And that sounded really exciting. I see what Johan yeah, was doing. Yeah, it's yeah. When, you, when you turn up, it's all gone. It's all gone uh, I'm a great believer yeah. in serendipity because when the plan is suddenly not happening, it's yeah. normally That's when the best you're sort happens. of viscerally involved in something. And yeah, yeah. it's exciting, yeah. And yeah. that teamwork <coughs> extends beyond just the shoot as well. I mean, especially if you're on a long, mm. long shoot, you sit and have dinner that night and you're all, oh, what, what happened in that scene when, you know, she came in and they had that fight and mm. now what's going to happen? And you mm. really play off each other and it's really important that sort of perspective that you, two or three of you have on what the characters are doing and what's going next, I think. Well, so that, that role that Anthony described himself of not what you do when you're filming a scene like mm. that with, with Paul, uh, how you don't want to make eye, eye contact mm. with who you're talking to, and you sort of hive on the back, but you're listening all the time. Mm. And also that sort of subtle approach you know, to Paul saying, maybe there's something happening over there, mm. but not getting involved is something, is a real skill. There's a, I mean, a there, real there, skill to have that. There is, there is a, it's not that we're completely, I mean, you, you do sort of shy back, but you, there are moments where I think, God, this is really, it's really sluggish and nothing's happening. And I might throw in a question, yeah. but the, the key, I, it's not the key, but I often then sort of, I will, Try to get the person, I won't even say anything, but don't look at me. Yeah. Throw the eye line off to the other character. If you start <laughs> doing that two, three times, then they'll just start talking to that other person. Mm. So then you just realise all you're doing is you're, mm. you're creating an element where they can start having a conversation with themselves. Mm. Um, I mean, I agree about the, you know, the, uh, the idea that people are sort of sent off to do these things. I actually don't think it's the, the fault of shelf shooters. It's actually execs and commissioning editors mm. who sometimes think this is the best way to look at a budget, and this is the best way to divvy it out. And whether or not it's that they kind of expect multiple hours in over a six month period or three month period, that the solution is right. Just go out and we'll just flood it with self-shooting people and come back and deal with it all in the edit and see what happens. When, you know, I think if, if, if it's not to say that it can't change because I, I, you, I got offered something by Channel 4, I said I can't do it, but I think a good way to do it is you, you have a very good, strong cameraman and sound man in there, and with a director who comes back and forth, but you make a buyout with them. So it, it can happen. I think it's about probably execs and commissioning editors getting together and having conviction for how it used to be done, and thinking it still can be done like that, that way. And, and you know, doing the maths. Yeah, and just doing the maths and thinking, you know, you don't have to have six crews out in one go down one street. Yeah, okay, let's... You value pictures, though. That's the important thing. Yeah. Do, do you value pictures? Yeah. You know, mm. images. Let's look at some more pictures. Mm. So we're going to have a look yeah, at... Uh, they say no, they don't. We're going to have a look at a, yeah, um, don't care. an arena that uh, Jana cut. So, Jana, th I mean, this is a... The, the, the job for you here is combining specially shot material and a lot of archive. So yeah. how do you work with... A, with a, I mean, this was a case, wasn't it, where, where you actually, as the editor, got involved very early with, with the director and the cinematographer <laughs> to... Yeah, so this is look. a good example of what we were talking about with the, the how the team works together because this is um, produced and shot by Martin Rosenbaum, who's here, who's hiding at the back. And um, he and Adam Lowe, the director, and myself uh, worked on this together and uh, with Martin and Adam... So Martin's a producer, but he's also the DOP. And I'm also involved from a very early stage. So they'll be filming all the way through the edit. In fact, you're probably filming right to the last day, Martin, I think. Um, so this is an, another way, I think, for that. And to make the budgets work and for that relationship to work. So Martin's very involved in all of the themes, the ideas, the so 
he, you know, he, go, he goes into it in the same way as these guys, you know, he's, yes, we're all having lunch together and talking about it and talking about ideas and where they might go. And so there's that. And then there's also that I'm starting, so I would have started with a few of the interviews and quite a lot of archive. So then through starting to put together the archive, then we can talk about what other visual elements we might need. So there's things like there, um, the see the conch shell on the beach. I think that came off from another, we we're filming something else and then they saw a conch. And so they, they can sort of pick up things along the way and it would have been shot, they usually shot over a really long period of time as well. So they'll be picking things up but I can't remember how long that one would have been filmed over, Martin, but a long time. And so for something like that, where you're, you're trying to integrate a very diverse, different types of archive, yeah. what, what are the key things that you need from the, from the, the shooter to help you bend, blend it together? Um, well, I think what I'm looking for is... I mean, what, what will happen on this type of job is it will be a very long editing period, and partly, how long is very long? Oh my god! Don't know how long it was. Months, months and months. Um, but partly because you're not doing what these guys are doing, which is already pre-selecting, already having, you know, doing a lot of the work on the shoot. We're doing all of the work in the edit. So, so those shots there will be from. I don't know how many different sources. Each shot there was from a different source. It was shot maybe 50 years apart from each okay. other. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there, we're, we're building something that works visually in the opposite mm -hmm. way. You're, mm -hmm. you're looking... What's the more time-consuming? It's much, much more time-consuming in the edit. Mm. It's a nice way to sort of instinctively cut because you're kind of drawing on metaphor and picture and, you know, and mood and, you know, the way that that guy looks over to your guys being interviewed and, you know. Yeah, it's great, it's great fun mm. to do, <laughs> <laughs> but it is enormously time-consuming yeah. mm. because all of the work so much that choice as the well. DOP do does. Yeah, I suppose with the, yeah. with the uh, rushes from the DOP, then you are limited to what they've actually shot. Mm. Yeah. So, which yeah. Is in many and they've ways... shot it. You know, you're thinking about how you're going to cut it together. Yeah. A particular scene, whereas these, this is totally yeah, random. Completely open, isn't it? So you're you're trying mm. to weave it, trying to make it look like one thing. Sorry, that was so distracting with that <laughs> um, thing. But it, I, I hope it did actually look like one coherent whole. Mm. Okay, so let's have a look at something that will go from one extreme to the other in a way. We we'll go from, from that with, with predominantly archived to something very, really quite stylized and controlled in uh, a film that another film that Nicholas shot. Uh, we'll have the next clip from Aim High and Creation. So, Nicola, do you want to tell us what that was all about? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just throw that in there for a bit of comedy. Um, it's a featured documentary that I shot. Um, Anna Bronowski was the director and... Uh, um, it's very strangely about North Korea and their filmmaking um, community and how they make films, because they make more films per year than Australia does. Um, and propaganda and then taking... She took coal seam gas in Australia in the fight for that and put those two very disparate things together. And uh, she, there's a film within a film, so she makes a film in a style of their films uh, to try and fight coal seam gas in Australia if that makes any sense <laughs> at all. So it's a, co it's a comedy doc, basically. And so how did you work with her on the visual stuff? Because, I mean, that's highly stylized, you know, compared to what we've been looking at so far. Obviously, yeah. that's very stylized, very controlled. How did you come up with, with the look? And, you know, how was that? Tell us about that process. She does, she likes to play, um, she did another great film, which a lot of you have probably seen, called Forbidden Lies, and she likes to play with the landscape of filmmaking, and, and, and she wanted to do that again in this, so... Um, we went to North Korea for about th nearly three weeks um, and so there's a lot of uh, stuff in there that she wanted to play with the, the architecture that was there. Uh, it's for the big screen so we're always thinking about 
about that as well and, and, and how it's going to impact and stand out really, you know, make that North Korea stuff uh, stand out from the rest of it. And then the Sydney stuff, it, it tends to be a bit more observational. We follow the actors who are all in the sort of orange jumpsuits going to sort of... Um, North Korean boot camp to learn how to become North Korean type actors. So it's uh, there was a lot of sort of yeah running up and down the beach with big signs of Kim Jong Il, which many people looked at as very strangely about. But so, um, but yeah, she just she wanted it to have a vision and she wanted it to be for the big screen and and really uh, stand out. So it was it was kind of a mixture of the two, the film. And as a cinematographer, we've been talking mostly about observational and being in the situation mm. and just trying to have to work out what happens and following, responding to, to unfolding actuality. This is the other extreme. You've got lots of control. You're setting things up. Presumably you can light things and so on. Which do you prefer of those? It was, it was actually... I trained on drama and, and documentary at the, at the National Film School in, in Australia and... I actually, I, I love doing both because I think they inform each other and I like to take my documentary skills into my drama work. So um, that idea of listening that we were talking about before and, and, being, and being sort of open to that emotive uh, access to actors, you know, even when you're in a controlled drama space and being able to just capture little things that you see on the side. I think directors often really really like that as well. And, and then you become, you sort of take those skills of, with I Am A Girl, I mean, we, we travelled around the world with a 74 lenses and one light and a tripod. And are you... 74 be, lenses, one no, light and a tripod? No, four, four lenses. Oh, right, okay. A 70... <laughs> 70 well, I don't think there were 74 lenses. <laughs> four lenses and one light. So you become quite good at looking at the, the natural light in a location and, and how you can really make that work for you, and I like to take that into my drama work. So I think the the two skills sort of I think they really complement each other in drama and doc. And so for something like this, that's a, a, a good mixture of those two. You can draw on those skills of lighting and framing and composition. But then, I mean, things happen in North Korea where you would just kind of oh, right, this let's just capture this, you know. So it, it it's a good meld. And Neil and Stephen, same question for you, really. I mean, presumably you, you do you don't just shoot actuality; you shoot much, much much more controlled stuff where you've got more where you can light and so on and so forth. Which do you, which is more rewarding for you? Observational. That's the most important thing. If you can do that and do it well, then you can do anything. I think really. And you know, working without any lights at all. I used to think that was a sign of, of, of defeat if you had to get a light out. <laughs> I'm not quite so hard, harsh on myself now, but I always thought that was the benchmark for me. Um, but uh, no, I think, yeah, it's being in the moment with a camera in, in a situation you don't quite know what's going to happen next is, is thrilling. Thrilling. You agree with that, Neil? I do agree with that, but I've, I'm, a, I'm probably slightly more Fay than, uh, than Steve, because I've, I've kind of... Um, <laughs> it's, it's terrible, isn't it? But um, I've got slightly e excited about the, uh, the new cameras that are around now. And, you know, being able... I mean, suddenly now we're, we're in a kind of period where... Actually, rather like Steve, I, you know, I love shooting on film, and I love having that discipline and that small camera, and it only did one thing, and everybody knew that was the, the heart of what you were doing there now. And it, and it is different now, you know, Technology's moved on, and you know the cameras sound like motorbikes these days. Um, uh, but 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 what's been what's I, I am excited now that we've sort of got the opportunity to shoot on sort of really on 35 mil sensors, start shooting on 35 mil lenses. Suddenly there are there is a kind of a phase at the moment where um, documentaries are starting to get commissioned for cinema, mm. and then I mean I've no doubt Steve like myself and. I mean, all of us here, we, you know, grew up watching movies and were slightly upset. Why, why are my pictures not quite as good as in the cinema? <laughs> and suddenly I've been putting on these sort of lovely lenses. I go, oh, my God, this is all, it, all I had to do was, like, have a 35-mil <laughs> camera, you know. So I'm, I'm actually really excited about all that. They cost a fortune and they weigh a ton and they run out of power and there's lots of bad things about it. But um, so anyway, that's kind of... a. You know, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I kind of get less and less calls to do observational filming these days. As a DOP who's got to sustain himself economically, um, you know, maybe I should more passionately say, no, I'm not going to do 
you know, an interview kind of type thing and, and do more things. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I get excited. I mean, I've been working with Anthony recently, um, you know, with lovely cameras, but also having the joy of shooting in that observational style. And that's been a really lovely kind of sort of coming together of sort of the old and the new, dare I say it. You know, it's, um, yeah, so I think... It's a you know. transferable skill, I think, if you can shoot that way, observationally, then you can... And it's used all the time now in, in, in all sorts of, sort of format programmes. Little bits of stuff that I do in those is still the same thing for me. It's still shooting observationally, but it just mm. happens to be within a bigger format. Yeah. So... But uh, I, you know, I like getting lights out too. But, uh, <laughs> not quite so, the same. Neil, you've perfectly introduced the next clip, which is from Anthony's uh, one of Anthony's upcoming theatrical docs. So let's have a look at that, which which you worked on. So, Anthony, mm. tell me about the choices you made there in terms of what you wanted to film, how you wanted to get. Um, well, it's very, this is kind of sort of a it's a mixture of different approaches because you know the bar thing in the sense is you, I wanted a locked off shot that that said quite a bit without just being one frame which is you know um, he reads the racing post and watches himself whilst racing and listening to people commenting about him whilst he's kind of in the bath you know losing weight it's a kind of full immersive thing that he does and so I wanted to kind of sort of express that and then there's the we did the long lens stuff when they went camping it's partly because I knew him and his family but didn't really know the other people so instead of us sort of going straight in and being very close up which I think would have kind of affected the way the dynamic of kind of the scene and also with kids around you kind of want to step back and shoot on a long lens and create this idea that you're kind of just observing and it gives you a good sense of geography as well. And the radio mics, and what was really charming about it was I knew that what AP does is he can't help but tell people about his injuries all the time. So, and, I, and just people just go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think if I would have been there, you know, you, you're, you're just creating a sense of, you know, they didn't know us, so why would they expect us to be completely natural? So that was, that's another sort of decision. And then the, the stuff in the changing room, which Neil shot so beautifully, is, is, is the fact that we talked about it. And I think it was one of the first days that, that we worked together. And, um, and I said, look, there's not really... I don't want you to follow a kind of story. There's no kind of intricate detail. I, I don't want to, to uh, pick up the sense of process about what happens when they weigh in or anything like that. I'm not interested in that detail. I'm interested in the fact that the night before, AP struggling with his weight. And the, the whole... The underlying theme of the film is about... It's about retirement and getting older and having a midlife crisis, which is, you know, always apt at my age. But anyway, he's, he's, it's all done through the prism of the retirement of this, of this sportsman. And so I said to Neil, just focus on age and look at the body, you know, and, that's, and we looked and we talked about that. And also then you kind of said, yeah, you could really notice it because all the other guys are half his age. And so you see his body's a bit frailer. And then, you know, the fact that it was, you know, he's looking at them going... Oh, you're younger than me and you know there's all so that's kind of that's that was the approach to that you know that's what was the main thing in our mind and not and just you know and knowing as well that you kind of I think it was the, it was the first thing I said go in and tell me what you thought well yeah I mean I, I mean first thing I've got to say I can't claim there's some uh, there's a few cameramen have worked on this so I can't claim all of those great images there's some fine cameramen that have sort of been collaborating with Anthony on this film. But I do remember that first day I came onto the project and you'd been, you'd been on the go for a few months at that point. And, um, uh, and Anthony said, you know, just go in there, just get a sense of, you know, this is the, the oldest jockey sits here, the younger ones sit there, you'll, you'll get the idea. And then I then sort of rather obsessively uh, with my new toy said, Anthony, this will look really good at 100 frames a second. Mm. And Anthony's brilliant. He goes, OK, yeah, just do it, just do it, just do it, just do it. OK, and, um, and, and actually it got... It just suddenly started to get really interesting. You see the world in a slightly different way. You know, you kind of... Um, in a way that if you're bolding in with a little video camera and a mic on the top, you know, and it was, an interesting, it was, it was sort of incredibly implicit what we were mm. shooting. And in fact, Anthony, I mean... Um, you know, I don't know what he does half the time, because he put you in the dressing room and he'd like, then stand out of shot. He'd stand, he'd stand in the doorway and I think, is he going to say anything? Is he going to talk to anyone? You're like, it's yeah. like, no, just you carry on. But it was, um, I suppose, I mean... It's hard to see in that trailer, but when, you, when the whole film... I think when the film comes out in its full length, I think there'll probably be a lot of scenes in that film where actually not a lot of that, not a lot of sync is actually going on with your characters whilst you're filming them. You know, you're, it's, it's all about observing those people and what they're going through, and it's much more kind of... 
it allows the viewer, I think, to make the decision about what's going on with them, rather than actually being sort of spoon-fed and sort of, you know, having them sort of talking mm. to somebody off the camera all the time. Yeah. I'm slightly around, but... I mean, I, I like to be able to sort of compose. I do think quite a lot, actually. I quite plan a film in my head beforehand. I've always got sort of multiple beginnings and endings, and I do quite like to paint the film in my own mind. And so it's almost as that when you go on location and you meet your characters, that's your set. You know, and you can think, okay, well, and you observe their behaviour and, you know, Jockey's going to have pretty much the same thing he does day in, day out. And you kind of think, well, what can I, out of this frame, out of this picture, what does it say about them that are actually about the themes that I'm interested in the film? And I think if you, I suppose the key is, is really then is to, once you have that collaboration with, you know, with a DOP or a series of DOPs and you understand that that's your grammar, you know, you want to stick to that. And I think that's one of the key things is sticking to that and, you know, like anything, you've got yourself some latitude, you know, if something suddenly happens and you, you aren't, you're not prepared for it. But, um, yeah, it's, it's more about having a plan. And, and also, but also and it's that commitment, because I, I remember that, that first day I started, started, I think I shot almost everything in slow motion, which a lot of directors would have said, well, Neil, that's fine, but actually, you know, and actually, best you know, Anthony sort of carried on. And I remember we had a conversation before the next day's filming, and Anthony said something like, you know, I've been watching those rushes forensically, and... Um, I think we should continue. I think we should continue on this theme. And essentially what I'm saying is, you know, the DOP, the conversation with the director can suddenly change the shape mm. and the images of the film in which perhaps the director may not have even thought of it. Yeah. Now, mm. I'm, turning up, I'm turning up with my new car mm. and I've got these unbelievably expensive lenses that I've sort of managed to sort of twist somebody's arm on. And suddenly, you know, you can bring a new, mm. you know, a new dimension. To, I mean, to yeah, because I'd started that film with, with zoom lenses. You know, and as you would, you'd think, OK, with natural actuality. And then I think, well, actually, I've built up quite enough already that I can kind of do some establishing stuff where I've, I've got a kind of a bed of those scenes. And then actually I thought, well, you know, and you said, let's use these prime lenses. And, you know, they, they fix you in a sense that you have to be, you have to move in, you know. And, um, I mean, it's tough for you because you've got to stay in focus. But it does, it does kind of give a certain sort of look, which is, you know, if it's for cinema, I think you, you have to... You have to bear that in mind and think, you know, there are reasons why um, lots of these sophisticated cameras and lenses are used for cinema, because um, you're quite exposed when you project onto a big screen. So when you've got a prime on and you're shooting on a 35mm sensor, then, I mean, you've, if you're, depending if you're wide open, you've got millimetres to spare, haven't you, in terms of the yeah, depth that, of field? Yeah, that, that, that is true. And then, but on the, on the plus side, if you make that commitment, when it works, it's really, really beautiful. When it doesn't work... Um, Hopefully Everyone somebody will chop that bit out, you know, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and it's fine. But, I, but you know, but, it, but it, all of this goes back round to the point that it doesn't always work, and some, when it works, it works beautifully, and when it doesn't, hopefully you can kind of work around it, you know, and it, and it does take um, commitment, and it does take bravery, um, you know, of the producer to kind of, like, invest in that, actually, you know, um, because I'm sure there's a lot of cutting room floor material, but when it, but when it works, it's really, really, you know, it's really lovely. Um, but one of, and one of the things that I think is happening, from what I gather, is that DV directors, when they finally get the gig to work with a DOP, there's a problem now, mm. because people who've done a lot of self-shooting and have been covering the action um, find it very, very hard to let a DOP loose and just trust. <laughs> and actually, you do have to trust. And so if you, if you've, once you've learned, if you've come up and learned as a, as a self-shooter... I think that's an, you know that's why I think there's all there's a lot of um, inadvertent consequences to the way that people have been working, which it means that the kind of poetry that DOBs can bring, you have to you have to just as a, as the as the director you have to trust that that is what they're doing that they're listening that they're paying attention, um, and and if you if you obsessively have been self-shooting and, and following the action and you have never worked in that way and you're not acclimatised to that method, um, I think that's making it very hard for DOPs now. It's when the hands go on the waist. <laughs> <laughs> Steering around and think, what's going on? I want to just get, try and get one last clip in before we uh, maybe take one or two questions. So think of some questions quickly because um, we won't have very long for them. Uh, but uh, there's one of the arguments that has been famously put up by a certain commissioning editor at Channel 4 who will remain nameless for the rise of the rig is that you can get much more intimacy with a rig, which is not, 
it's not getting rid of the DOP and, and using a DV director or a shooting AP. It's getting rid of people controlling cameras completely and just sticking them up in corners. Um, Vanessa, I'm guessing you don't really buy that argument about rigs being more intimate. Well, I do in a way. Um, in that something like 24 hours in police custody where they've got a rig in a the police interview room, you know, that's a place where you wouldn't be allowed in with a crew. And I think in that that show we have seen incredible intimacy and and footage that we would never otherwise have seen without a rig. But obviously, if you're shooting in lots of different places, you can't rig them all. So for, I think for certain, for certain projects, I think it has been amazing. For One Born Every Minute, I think it's been amazing because you wouldn't probably get in so easily to that many births. Um, so I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't absolutely, I think it's, you know, different, different things work in different contexts. But I suppose the point about um, that clip that I chose is that, that when we're filming Harley Street, we're in lots of really, really tiny um, consulting rooms. And I know when we were shooting it, Johan kept saying, oh, Christ, you know, we're really in trouble now because I've got to shoot a whole series and every room you take me into is the size of a broom cupboard and they've all got horrible sort of strip lighting and how am I supposed to make this look um, good? Um, and that room was absolutely minute and that woman was very very nervous she was nervous that her english wasn't good and um it had been very hard to persuade her to take part so in that room there's an octodome there's johan there's the sound recordist um i'm outside so there's literally not room for me obviously except when i'm doing the interview um, Johan's a very big man. And well. he's a big bloke. <laughs> uh, and I have taken that very big man into many very, very small spaces. And. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so my experience is that in very tiny places where a rig would be out of the question and a rig would be much too expensive and unthinkable, um, well, Steve's clip is an amazing clip and shows the same thing that that extraordinary intimacy, not only can you achieve it with a crew, but you can achieve it with a crew and shoot it very beautifully. So, Stephen, both your clips were from Jane Trey's films. And, you know, Jane's very well known for building up very strong relationships with her, with her contributors. Do, does that work? For, do you, are you involved in that as well? Is it essential that you're along yeah, for that journey? Yeah, it was, actually. To be fair, I think that was the last film I, sh I shot... Um, in its entirety uh, with Jane, although she and I did 18 films together. But, um, and I, but I haven't worked with her much since then. <laughs> Just, you know, what went wrong? Well, nothing. I think, uh, well, actually, she, she moved off in a different direction. And, uh, and you know, we worked together on, on Claridge's a bit, and there's something coming up we're going to work together on. But, you know, I think you do a lot of films, 18 films is a lot of films to do together. And you know each other pretty well by the end of that. But that's also very important, to have that trust. But going back to the clip... Um, and also, I agree with Vanessa. There, there's definitely an argument for the rig working, and certainly 24 Hours and A and E is a great, great series. And you couldn't possibly do that with a, you wouldn't want to do it with a with a camera in your hand. Um, but the car park scene with um, Hannah was about a relationship you build up with people <coughs> you're filming. Uh, uh, and again, that word trust. They got to trust you, and they just don't notice you're there. Uh, and that comes across in that clip. And you couldn't have done that with a rig. But I do think as well that there is this argument. I often hear self-shooters um, saying that, you know, that there's, they think that they're getting footage that you couldn't get with a crew. And I yeah. do really, really yeah. utterly disagree with that. That idea, and I, I am the first person ever to shoot a full-length documentary uh, myself in this country, and I never did it again. <laughs> um, and it was really handy, you know, whenever my contributors said, you know, do you want to film tonight? I could go. It didn't cost me anything. I'd jump in my car. I could go. It was handy and it was easy. But that idea that um, that, that kind of relationship, that you can only establish that if it's just you and the camera, is, is clearly nonsense. And I think, um, although we're joking about the fact that Johan is a big guy, he is a big guy and Andy is a tall guy and... If you are working with experienced DOPs who are really good at what they do, they become invisible. Mm. You know, I, I can take them anywhere and they will become invisible, um, even in a very small space. And so that idea that the intimacy in lo is lost when there's lighting and equipment and a, num a, a number of people, three of us in a room... Um, I absolutely you know, refute that that in any way um, disrupts the intimacy of scene because a, a good DOP um, has a sort of 
invisibility cloak, and it's a remarkable thing. And, you know, and actually, when Steve was shooting that film, actually, there would have been a sound recordist. Mm. There would have probably been a camera assistant who might have just tucked around the corner. Maybe not. You're loading yourself. Okay. But, I mean, there's a lot of... Despite the fact, you know, you might go from self-shooter, which is one person, generally, with a bigger unit, you've got minimum four people. But I agree, you know, you can... It's yeah, a, myth, it's a myth also that you need to, to create intimacy, you need to be close to somebody. Mm. That's mm. a big, big myth. You've got to be here with a camera right in front of their face, right next to them. That's not intimacy at all. That's, that's, and also, you're, by doing that, you are affecting what is going on. And what I like to do uh, um, is shoot further away on a longer lens. Not all the time, but being further away, you can observe much better. And I think being more intimate. Uh, but um, I'm sure others would disagree. Okay, can we can we have the lights up a bit and uh, so we can see? Is there any who's got some who's got a question for this wonderful panel? I can't see at the moment. There we, I can see someone there. So, we got, uh, do we get on your mic? Great. You'll have to if you're back there. You'll have to wave your arm furiously because I can't see very well. Um, I was I was very interested in the discussion um, between um, Anthony and Neil about the collaborative process between the DOP and the director. I was just wondering. Um, Given that, and given that you said that you had several um, DOPs working on your project, how do you kind of achieve that kind of cohesiveness of style throughout They're the project? They're all nightmares in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean... they Should they, say what they say about you. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, well, they, they, you know, as much as you, as much as you want to be able to kind of buy out someone and sort of say this is going to be one thing, you, you have to be realistic to, that, that um, you know, you can't always get the same person. So... Um, I think you just have to acknowledge that there are different styles and that I didn't bother me that much because I thought there were different elements in this film that would lend itself to these different styles. And I would then sometimes make specific decisions about certain days that I'd like to film that I want to capture certain sequences that I would use different DOPs for different things. It wouldn't be that one's better than the other. They just bring a different set of skills. Um, and I think, you know... So Neil was slow-mo. Uh, no, 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 no. Neil, Neil brought an amazing but cinematic quality, which, uh, which just was implicit. No, no, I, I mean this seriously. It was, it, it's more that it, uh, you know, the, 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 well, it's about your eye, and let's not get too... But, but, you know. no, but, but I think, I mean, I, I, Anthony's saying, because I think, there, you know, you bring something different to the table. There's Andy Thompson, who's, like, phenomenally brilliant, handheld, observational, and same with, you know, Steve is particularly, and, um, and a, um, a really young guy, Tom... Elliot. Tom Elliot, who's just... Uh, terrifies me. Young, handsome, got state-of-the-art camera, like <laughs> frightening, oh my God. Um, you know, yeah, he just and, and he, and, it, and, and uh, yeah, it did slightly obsess me, but he, um, but he, you know, he was brilliant yeah. at all that sports stuff, you know, he, he came from uh, a kind of like Extreme snowboarding skiing. and all that stuff, and his, his stuff was really wonderful, and he was working um, really resourcefully with a slightly different setup with, with his sort of choice of lenses and camera, but it's sort of really wonderful. So I think, yeah, you know... You make of... decisions about what, you know, you kind of look at... Well, I look at it and I think, right, well, this is, you know, this is the sort of look of the film and there are certain elements that I want and then you kind of do your homework and you think, who are the people that you want to work with? And plus you want to get on with them, and, you know, share a particular uh, sort of um, vision. I can see in that clip, in fact, we, we saw uh, the uh, picnic, the football match. Mm. I could see what the camera was doing. I thought, yeah, exactly. I would do the same thing. Yeah. You come behind the long grass. Yeah, and you yeah. You shoot through that. Yeah. Because that just makes it, it just elevates it. And yeah. I would do the, so I would do the same thing. I mean, maybe other people wouldn't. I don't know. But I could see mm. shots I would have done myself. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Do that, do that, do that. Petrograph yeah, calls yeah. it a dirty foreground. Yeah, that's yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, make it dirty, of course, all the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, down here. Yes, yeah. person on the right, first of all. Well, just fight over it. Arm wrestle for mine. <laughs> uh, question for Vanessa. Uh, I, I get the feeling that you spent a lifetime actually working with crews. Why have you decided to uh, self-shoot a film? And uh, did you have funding before you did it? I self-shot that film, uh, that was 19 years ago. And I was working with John Wyver, who's very interested in being future forward at the time. And they imported a D, the first ever Sony DV camera for me. Had no idea how to use it. No one could show me because we'd never, we'd never had one before. Um, and it, it, was, it was an experiment. It was to see what would happen if you unleashed a camera in the hands of somebody like me who didn't know what they were doing. 
Um, and the whole thing was on autofocus, auto exposure. There were many complaints to the BBC that night. <laughs> and I had to fend them off by saying it was a film about an artist. Oh, and um, it was a film about an artist, and all her work was very sort of handmade and cobbled together. And therefore, the film was deliberately handmade and cobbled together. Um, so I was doing it. I thought it, you know, I, I mean, I, I do, I have some artistic training myself. I'm, you know, I was confident in composing shots. I was not confident in using the camera. Or, and I was doing sound as well. Um, so I was up for, I was, I was totally up for giving it a go. Um, but there were many times when I had tears pouring down my face behind that camera. And that's why I didn't do it again. Um, and like I say, I, I abandoned it. Partly I'm just not the person, you know, I can put a kettle on and I can put the washing machine on, that's about the size of it. Um, but I very immediately realised that there, for me, filmmaking is not just about, there is a level of poetry and metaphor that comes through craft, through the craft of, you know, an editor who's um, finding motifs and juxtaposing things through the cameraman bringing, you know, a good DOP brings you a whole level of poetry and metaphor that if you're just scrabbling around trying to follow something, you just can't do. So it was a very enjoyable experiment up to a point um, and not one that I wish to repeat. <laughs> and the person... Yeah, you've got the mic. Okay. Would you say that, that this is an interesting time in terms of the tool? Because maybe for the first time since 16 mil, we're seeing pretty much exactly the same tool. Uh, being used, say you're using an Amira with PL lenses, Skyfall was shot on an Alexa with PL lenses. So for the first time, you're seeing a real confluence of the tool. And really, the, in terms of putting that cinematic quality on the screen, the only thing that, that's different now is the process and, and how you work, how you're forced to work in the room. Now, the, the tool is pretty much the same now. So what would you say are the key differences between being in a real room with with a real unfolding story with that with that kind of 35 mil camera and working on something more fiction based what what is the real difference in what the DOP does how would you define it I, I mean I, I don't know I, mean, I would I would say that actually now there's there's actually there should be very little difference between what Steve and I were doing too long ago um, on 16mm cameras and what we'd be now be doing with that technology. But the, in, the exciting thing about that technology is that suddenly we're, we're going out, we're, we're, we're driving around in the back of the car as a camera that can sort of produce the images that we are now used to seeing, you know, in the cinema. And I think that's, in, from a technological side of view, I think that's really exciting. But ultimately, it's still, the, the actual process still means being put in a small room by Vanessa or Anthony and, and trying to unravel the story in the you know photographically. I mean, nothing. There should be no change in that whatsoever. The 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 exciting thing is if we can afford it, and and if the resources allow it, we can suddenly now shoot things that actually you know have a cinematic look to them, which is really exciting. But you know the problem is these days is that the budgets are tighter. There's much more pressure um, on productions to self shoot. Um, there's less opportunity, you know, arguably less opportunity to use that technology on some of these films that, um, you know, would, would have been always shot by a DOP. And now, you know, you, you make, it's hard to get, you know, DOPs on some of those projects, I think, probably with the technology, which is a shame, actually, because I think it would be really, really, really lovely. But um, it's, the same, it's the same job. You're doing the same thing with the camera, as I said earlier, I think. The Amira is, uh, is a fantastic camera uh, and uh, it makes life easier in a sense because you know that the pictures will be that much better you can see, and what that camera gives you is uh, the ability to see things that you couldn't previously see with a camera I mean what the human eye has always seen it but the camera uh, until recently hasn't really been able to see it certainly shoot on film um, you were stuck with low light and and you had to work much harder with video to get what you saw onto the onto the camera into the camera um, but ultimately, you know, for a DOP, um, it's about what you see that counts. And it's about capturing what you see. So you need a camera that can enable you to capture what you see. As simple as that. And that's not changed. 
Okay, we're going to have one last question because we're just pushing the envelope a little bit. So who's got... There we go. Someone waving up at that. I hope it's a really, really good last question. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. Best question of the session. Um, I just wanted to know... I just wanted to ask Nicola the question. You know, when you filmed in North Korea, I just really just wanted to know what the process was to film in that country and how you got out of the country, <laughs> basically. Yeah. There was a fence. No. Um, it took the director and producer two years to, uh, to get permission to go in, and we were guided everywhere, so uh, we were told, you can't film that. You can't, I mean, you can film that. There were some great things we were not allowed to film that will, you know be in my memory and she's written a book about it so it's you know it's in there but um uh, they actually funny story they uh they made her sign a contract that said basically there was a clause in it that said if you show us all the rushes we will help you get out through customs <laughs> and she said don't worry Nicola I will I will sign this so we, can, we will leave so she signed it and kind of they checked everything and I mean, as much as she sat with them and and showed them some rushes and they were concerned about very bizarre things like they all wear pins with our dear leader on and it was whether the microphone was covering that and things like that but they were happy and let us let us go so it was a it was a great trip yeah if you want to shoot in gaza you have to sign a piece of paper for the israeli defense force that says we'll show you everything when we leave and fortunately they never actually ask but you have to sign this thing saying we will yeah. if you let us in Okay, thank you very much to our fantastic panel, and thank you very much to you. <laughs>